alleged that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. Hi, my name is Tara Brookfield. I teach at Laurier's Brantford campus and I'm delighted to be invited by the Brant Historical Society to share my research on the Brant Orphan Home for Girls. So thank you to the Historic Society for including me in their speaker series. Two things I'd like to say before we get started. One is that I really wish we could be in a room together. I know you are the experts on local history and I bet some of you would have interesting things to share with me about the individuals and the property I'm going to discuss. Since we can't be together, I'd be happy to take any questions or receive any feedback by email. And my address is here on this first slide, tbrookfield at wlu.ca. Secondly, I'm recording this from my home and I share my home with two dogs and two other humans and you might hear them in the background. So I apologize if there's any distracting noises. I have a bunch of images to share, wonderful historic photographs and other artifacts. So I think I'm gonna turn off my camera so you can focus on the images before you. So my presentation is on the Sheridan Street Home for Girls, which began in 1876 and then closed in 1905. I'm only going to be focusing on the first sort of 10 years or so of the home itself. On January 28, 1869, four-year-old Elizabeth Calford arrived at 7 Sheridan Street. She had been born in Brantford and was the youngest of eight children, a survivor of smallpox, and had lost her father a year earlier. That's an awful lot for a four-year-old to have gone through. Her mother was described, and I quote, as being in destitute circumstances indeed, rendering it simply impossible for her to support her children, end quote. While the fate of Isabel's siblings is unknown, she was to be placed in an orphanage, a not uncommon temporary or permanent childcare solution for single parent families struggling to make ends meet in an era in which there was no public welfare supports for children or their families. So Isabel would have probably said goodbye to her family not knowing if she was ever to see them again and go to live for strangers who were thought to have cared for her better. She became the very first resident, or to use the vocabulary in vogue at the time, the first inmate of the Orphan Home for Girls, an initiative of Bradford philanthropist Thomas Shenston. Shenston was a British born harness maker and saddler and the father of six living children. Despite a modest start in his life, patronage appointments, and business savvy helped Shenson rise to the positions of Register, Magistrate, and Commissioner for Brant County, where he also had business interests in insurance, real estate, and banking. A devoted Baptist, Shenson was a deacon in the First Baptist Church and active in the Baptist Foreign Missionary Society. He also frequently pontificated on the importance of hard work, faith, temperance, and other moral issues in the Brantford Expositor, or in his own self-published books. I think he published his books with this particular bookseller. This card was found in his papers in the Toronto Public Reference Library Fonds. Shenson's biographer estimates that in the 1870s, during the peak of his wealth, Shenson donated approximately 2,000 per annum to charities, of which the orphanage was his most special project costing him between $1,200 and $1,400 per year. In 
You can tell his pride by looking at this invite he sent to dozens of Brantford's most prominent citizens, those connected with all the different churches in town, as well as those who were in industry and other positions of social or political power. Jensen described the goal of his new project as a home for female orphans who are friendless, where he promised that, quote, great attention will be paid to religious exercises and to training the children's mind to the orderly observance of the Sabbath, so as to readily and naturally fall into proper habits. The initial startup of the home was supported also by a name I bet most of you are familiar with, Ignatius Cockshut, the local manufacturer of farm machinery and Branford's leading philanthropist. It was Cockshut and his wife who donated the building and initial furnishings for the home. The orphanage was also a family affair. Shenston's wife, Mary, and his sister, Jemima, were also involved in the running of the home. And Jemima, a spinster, was the one who was the matron of the home who would live with the girls and care for them. Shenston described her as incredibly devout and said her whole time as nurse, cook, housekeeper, religious instructor uh, was done for free and solely for, quote, Christ's sake. Here's the image of the property that I'm speaking of. At the end of the presentation, I'll share a modern, uh, excuse me, a modern photograph of the same building. At its founding, the home was the only orphanage in Brantford, which at the time had a population of approximately 8,000. Situated in a two-story brick building in what the Brantford Expositor described as, quote, one of the most healthy parts of town, the home could house up to 30 girls at a time. From the Expositor article, Describing the opening of the home, they have a bit of a description of the inside. The journalist said, upon entering, we were ushered into the reception room, which is tastefully furnished. On the lower flat is a schoolroom, dining room, kitchen, and spare room. Upstairs are the bedrooms, bathroom, private rooms of the matron, and a room in which little people will prepare their lessons and engage in such recreation as may be provided. The article also noted that a gallery was reserved for the girls at the nearby First Baptist Church. As a private orphanage, Thomas Shenston was not required to make a report or accept visits from the provincial inspector of prisons and asylums, and therefore information about the home is scant. There are some expositor articles and a few pieces of correspondence that have been saved between Shenston and Cockshut. You can track the inhabitants of the property through the census and land registry, and town directories. But the most vibrant evidence of the home and its inmates is a photo album. Measuring five by five by eight inches, which contains individual portraits of the first 26 girls to reside in the home. And here's an image of the cover. And it's not held actually at the Brant Museum and Archives, but it's at the Toronto Public Reference Library, which Thomas Shenson has left his papers. Some of his papers are also at the Baptist Church Archives in Hamilton. So tonight I'm going to share with you stories of the girls depicted in the album and analyze what this amazing artifact can tell us about life in the home, Shenston's goals, the purpose of the photographs, and discuss the prospects for an orphan girl in late 19th century Brantford. Now remember Isabel was the first inmate that you met earlier. For a few days, she would have been the only child in the home before she was joined by six-year-old Mary Jane from Simcoe County. Mary Jane is described in the album as having been taken away from, quote, a wretched place, the Brantford home of her mother who was separated from her absent husband. A month later, three-year-old Lily Martlett from Ancaster joined them. Lily was an only child being brought up in, quote, wretched and wickedness by her grandmother since her mother died when she was only eight days old. Her father was alive, but had never seen or supported her, according to information reported by the Shenstons. And I wonder how Isabel, Mary Jane, and Lily would have got on in those first few days where they're the only ones living with Jemima Shenston in the home. Over the next two years, 23 other girls between the ages of two and 12 would join them. They would include 15 girls born nearby, including six indigenous girls and an additional 11 girls were British home children arriving from passenger ship coming from a workhouse in London, England. With the exception of the English girls whose travel was arranged by an immigration society, 
the girls appear to have been brought to the home directly by a relative or upon recommendation from a clergyman who saw the orphanage as a reputable destination for girls with no respectable kin to care for them. The community trusted the Shenstons to be steadfast guardians of the orphans' moral education and financial well-being. Before I tell you more about the girls themselves, I want to pause to talk about the album itself and the photo photography inside. Here is a full page from the orphan, excuse me, from the album. The pictures of the girls were at the top of the page, and then there, the, the, there were these handwritten notations underneath. The photos are taped or glued, and there is a blank page beside it to be left uh, to fill in perhaps more information about the girls. In this commentary below, the girls, the situation the girls were in was usually described and how they came to be in the care of the Shinsons. Usually their parents were dead, impoverished, drunken, or otherwise incapacitated. The commentary about their fractured families is juxtaposed against the respectability of the girls are posed to exude in the photos, underpinning the transformative nature of the orphanage. And this is what I imagine Shenston and most orphanages at the time were set up to do, remove children from circumstances of neglect or immorality or parents who were not present and allow them a space in which they could grow up respectably, morally, and therefore not be a future burden or drain on society. So it's partly humanitarian and partly for the best interests of the community to have proper girls being raised. In the full length photos, girls wear simple dresses with boots and shoes. Their hair is neat, either cut by their ears or pulled back with a ribbon or gathered under a hat. Fitting the portraiture style of the time, the girls' bodies in the photos are very stiff and their faces hold a distant, docile gaze. Only one girl is smiling and I'll show her in a few minutes. Unlike many child portraits, the girls are not pictured next to symbols of childhood such as toys, dolls, school books, or games. Nor are the photos reminiscent of Lewis Hines' early 20th century portraits of working children, where they are set against the harsh urban industrial or agrarian landscapes in which they toil. Rather, this photographer has posed the girls in a replica of a parlor next to formal drapery, urns full of flowers, or a table holding a large book, possibly the Bible. This served a functional purpose as one had to hold still for several moments and leaning against the furniture gave the girls something to brace themselves on. Occasionally a backdrop of a window overlooking a pastoral river view is included in the frame, and the girls stand in the type of room they want one day have in a home of their own, or more likely be expected to clean as a domestic servant, which is one of the major future paths that they could take. Now the photos of the girls were in a style known as the carte visite, a small photograph mounted on cardboard that were popular in the 1860s. These were relatively inexpensive to have taken and people of all different backgrounds from working class to royalty had them made. And you would get multiple copies of the same photo so you could trade with your friends. There was also celebrity cards made of royalty, performers, politicians that could be purchased in stationary stores and traded. Brantford had multiple businesses offering the services at the time, though it was unclear in which, which one Shenston used, and if the girls and adults all went in at once or one at a time when they arrived. Shenston described his work at the home as a labor of love, and this sentiment might explain why he, or maybe his wife or sister, is unclear exactly who put the album together or wrote the text, chose to memorialize the experiences with a photo album. Historian Elizabeth Siegel studies the meaning of Victorian era photo albums, calling them cherished keepsakes, usually put on display in the parlor to help people understand who they were and shaped how they imagined their memories and histories. Now, having looked at Thomas's other um, personal papers, he had a prolific collection of scrapbooks and photo albums. These were mainly filled with news clippings of articles he authored or were featured in and he appears to have had a strong desire to amass and preserve the public recognition of his charitable and church work. Possibly the ritual of putting together and displaying and narrating other viewers observation of his ephemera helped solidify his identity as a community leader, faithful Baptist and respectable citizen. <laughs> 
Even so, Shenson's decision to have individual portraits taken of his orphan charges was relatively unique. While the archives of some 19th century orphanages have group photos of staff and inmates, I have never found any references to portrait style photos or albums in Ontario, excuse me, in Ontario or elsewhere. An exception would be abolitionists, those who are against the um, against slavery, did take photographs of former enslaved children, which they sold to raise money for the anti-slavery cause. Now the intentions of the inmates orphans home album appear both operational and functional. It probably operated as a record of the home's first entrance, much like um, a log book, but it only had those who appeared between 1869 and 1871. And as I mentioned before, the page on the left was blank, excuse me, the page on the right was left blank. And perhaps at one point, there was an intention to add more information about the girl's progress in the home or their departure. In this case, we just have Elizabeth Hawthward left the home. And this is the only annotation on any of the blank pages and it has no detail. And I'm not sure if this was written when she actually left the home or if it was just sort of like the heading that would be later filled in. It is possible the album was shown to visitors to advertise the availability of girls for placements as domestic servants or apprentices. Adoption was exceedingly rare in this era. The inclusion of other items such as individual portraits of the nine adults associated with the home, a newspaper clipping commemorating the home's opening, and other photographs showing the exteriors of the home and nearby churches suggest the album was acted as a scrapbook, most likely kept by the home's founder or his female relatives. Despite plenty of remaining space in the album, the practice of recording and photographing the orphan girls did not last beyond the summer of 1871, even though Shenson remained involved in the home for another eight years. It is possible the album's upkeep was abandoned due to cost or tedium or simply thought to be unnecessary. Regardless of the original intention, a century and a half later, the album acts as an exceptional artifact. It tells of the local imperial and colonial child saving history offering a visual representation and rhetoric about the impressions of and hopes for impoverished and orphan girls from Britain and Canada. In particular, the presence of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous girls makes the home a rare case of integrated institutionalization and a contact zone between the settler community of Brantford and nearby Indigenous reserves. Overall, the album gives visibility to immigrant, Indigenous and local girls on the margins of society. Let's meet more of those girls. This is Mary Williams, and she's the only girl in the album who has a bit of a smile on her face. And to me, you can kind of get a sense of the spark of her personality. Mary was the sixth admission to the home and was the first Indigenous girl. While the album does not overtly reflect the Shenstons' thoughts on race relations or colonialism, the inclusion of Indigenous girls suggests the family did not believe in segregation. The language used to describe the personal histories of the Indigenous girls is not more or less disparaging than the vocabulary used for the non-Indigenous girls. In Mary's case, her family history was described as having a dead mother and a poor and blind father, and she was between the ages of four and five years old. The album states that she was received at the recommendation of Reverend John Hill, and in brackets he's identified as an Indian, and it was left she had brought with her instructions on where letters could be sent home. So she must have had some sort of kin still interested in her well being. It is unclear why Mary or the other Indigenous girls were not taken to the Mohawk Institute, which, as some of you might know, it was an Indian residential school located three kilometers away. The Mohawk Institute had been open since 1834, and 60 years before the residential school had even was compulsory for Native children classified as status Indian. Perhaps the Indigenous girls who ended up under the Shenson's care had been raised as Baptists. The Mohawk Institute, in my understanding, was an Anglican institution, or had been at least identified in need by a Baptist. It's also possible the home simply had more available space at the time than the Mohawk Institute. While Shenson's orphanage was not a residential school, it had similar methods and goals. The removal of an Indigenous child from her family and community, and her tutelage under the care of white Christians. What we know about the history of colonialism in the Brantford area and the tragic history of removing children from Indigenous communities suggests that even if the home provided tender and loving care 
the caregivers would be unlikely to respect indigenous beliefs and traditions. Of the indigenous girls, Mary Slats, a Mohawk, was the only one identified in the album as being able to speak English before arriving in the home. Only one other girl, Louise Peters, a Delaware, had her nation specifically identified. It is unknown what clothing or hairstyles the girls arrived with, but in the album, everyone is dressed in European styles. A few decades later, it became the process of assimilation to take before and after photos of indigenous children attending residential schools. In the case of this album, there is no before pictures, only the after, after they had arrived. So I'm not sure if Mary Louise and Mary Williams, the girl you saw on the previous slide, might have come to the home in more traditional hair, clothing, or other um, personal belongings. Although the Holmes album contained no before photos, the text about the girl's tragic family histories was meant to represent the past while the portrait symbolized a more hopeful, stable future for them. A striking feature of the album is the Shinson's desire to record the histories of Ellen and Elizabeth Thomas, whose pages in the album are here. You'll notice that there's no photos on these pages. And it seems that this represents the resistance to being in the home. These two indigenous sisters hailed from Muncie town a reference to the Muncie Delaware Nations Reserve near St. Thomas, about 175 kilometers from Brantford. The Thomas sisters arrived together a few months after the home opened and are described in their entries of having a dead mother and father, excuse me, a dead mother and a poor and sick father. A black space remains above each of their entries because according to the entry, neither girl, quote, could be induced to sit for her photograph, quote. So there's no details about how the girls might have been so-called induced. Did they simply refuse? Did they, and their consent was respected? Were bribes attempted or is there gentle coaxing? Or could corporal punishment be involved? Their entries also mention that the girls attempted to run away time and again and would make no attempt to speak English. Ultimately, the girls went back to their home in Muncieville about a month after they arrived. And there's no explanation about why that was the best for them. According to the album's notions, or excuse me, notations, both sisters wept when they said goodbye. It's unclear how to interpret the inclusion of the Thomas sisters in the album, even without their photos, rather than skipping over their brief stay. Was this decision due to the thoroughness of the album's creator to solemnly record the history of the home? Or did the failure to save the girls haunt the Shensons in some way? Perhaps the rebellious sisters were simply too memorable to exclude. Historians can read this resistance as evidence of the sisters' agency, their independent way of making their, um, their wishes, their actions known, which is also very unusual in children's history. Often children are often the most vulnerable historic actors and don't often have an opportunity to have their voices captured or their actions um, be autonomous. In the Thomas sisters' invisibility, we have a sliver of their voice in the impact they made on the home. The lack success of so-called reforming them did not preclude the home's further attempts and including Indigenous girls. Beyond the six represented in this album, the fragmented records show at least two other Indigenous girls being housed in the home in 1877. Eighteen months after the home opened, two groups of British home children arrived, and these were among the first to come to Canada. Their arrivals were arranged by Reverend A. Stileman Herring, vicar of St. Luke's Clerkenwell, London. Herring had founded the Clerkenwell Immigration Society, which was geared towards providing more sustainable lives and land purchases in Canada for working class families in his East End London parish. A subset of his migrants included orphan boys and girls from London workhouses, who were to be placed with Canadian families or temporarily housed in orphanages until a placement could be sought. It's unclear how Herring became acquainted with Shenston's small orphanage, though presumably Shenston felt the new phenomenon of bringing London's poor children to a British dominion aligned with his own values. Among Herring's recruits destined for Brantford was Eliza Burns, who had been raised along with her six siblings by her brother after her parents' deaths. She was known to be, quote, cruelly treated by her brother 
which caused her to run away several times. Quote, when found the last time, she preferred to go to St. Luke's workhouse rather than return to her brother. Thus, Eliza and Herring's other charges would have had experience living in an institution, albeit, albeit not one previously segregated by age or gender or as small as Shenston's home. The British home children remained with the Shenstons for several years, so their stay was more than temporary. The inclusion of Herring's portrait near the end of the album suggests he made a stop in Brantford when he toured Ontario in 1871 to check on the immigrants he brought to Canada. Thomas Shenson believed the home would prepare all his charges for domestic service or apprenticeship so the girls could be self-supporting. In addition to their moral education, he wanted his girls to be sufficient, self-sufficient. Using the census, registry records, and Shenson's correspondence, had been able to trace what happened to 16 of the 26 girls featured in the first pages of the album after they had left the orphanage. Many of the girls appear to have met Shenson's goal of not being future burdens, and some had the opportunity beyond servitude and work. For others, sickness, sexual assault, and pregnancy meant restricted futures. Census records show that 20 of the girls remained in the home for at least two years, and 12 of them were there for at least eight years. Three of the girls, Annie Godfrey, Lily Martlett, and Lucy Mills, were baptized as Baptists in Shenson's church in their mid to late teens. The 1881 census shows that Sarah Barlow and Lucy Mills worked locally as domestic servants, and the latter was placed in the home of Shenson's son, son Reuben. Catherine Gary would marry at age 21 and have two children. Arriving at the home at age three was Julia Ann Clement, one of the youngest girls, and her youth probably contributed to her adoption by the Shower family a year later. And she's the only child who appears to have been adopted as a daughter not a servant or companion. Meanwhile, two girls were reunited with their biological relatives. At the age of 16, Eliza Emma Scott, who studied dressmaking while at the home, returned to live with her mother. And when she was 15, Annie Godfrey reunited with her brother, who was also a British home child or had later immigrated to Canada. After she left the home, Annie had boarded in Brantford and Toronto, where she worked as a clerk and stenographer. Between 1876 and 78, Sarah Allen, Mary Slats, Annie Gary, and Eliza Byrne were placed in local homes with individuals with whom Shenston described as, quote, good women. Of course, the good placement did not necessarily equate stability. In letters to Coxa reporting on the home's progress, Shenston lamented the lack of permanence for Sarah Allen and Eliza Byrne's placements for very different reasons. Although the home reportedly never had a death or significant illness. Eliza had recurring stomach ailments attributed to the aforementioned abuse by her brother when she lived in England. Shenson commented to Coxa that Eliza appears to have been well liked in her multiple placements, but had to return frequently to the home due to her stomach problems. At age 21, Eliza, excuse me, at age 21, Eliza still remained in the orphanage when she wrote to Shenston expressing her gratitude to him his wife and his sister for their kindness over the years. This is the only evidence I have found created by one of the girls themselves. First of all, I'm always amazed at the wonderful, neat penmanship that she had. So she obviously learned to read and write while at home. This is a quote from her letter. The Lord has not placed me in a position to repay you back for your kindness, only to turn out to be a good girl, which I pray the Lord that I may do so and that I never be led astray into a slippery path after all the years of instruction and privileges I have received. I know some of the girls have caused you and dear auntie a great deal of trouble, and perhaps you think that all the time and expense has been in vain, but I trust it is not, though you cannot see much of the good seed sown springing up at the present. It is possible that one of the girls on the so-called slippery path that Eliza, excuse me, Elizabeth mentioned was Sarah Allen. Sarah, who like Elizabeth, came from the St. Luke's workhouse when she was 11 years old. The album's admission notes singled her out for being able to read a bit. Yet eight years later, any of Shenson's hope for Sarah were dashed by his, her inability to settle into any placements. In reference to two failed placements in 1877 alone, Shenson called Sarah, and I quote, not a good girl by any means, end quote, and he underlines the word not. 
No details are given about why she returned to the home, but clearly Shenston felt Sarah's bad character was the problem. Shenson's biggest disappointments were the fate of two unnamed girls who were seduced in 1878. Seduced was a term used at the time that could mean sexual assault, rape, for example. Um, and the case that he refers to in this article for the Brantford Expositor suggests one of the seductions happened by a delivery boy and the other was from an unknown male. Given the timing of this article, it is unlikely either the girls mentioned were Sarah Allen in the picture I just showed before. In this article, which Shenson entitled Protection to Women and Girls, he laments the behavior of the men for preying on simple and unsophisticated orphan girls, one of whom became pregnant because of this seduction. He rants against the seducer's lack of punishment and the fact that he estimated to have spent $500 over the years raising one of the affected girls ensuring that she could not have had better temporal or spiritual welfare under the care of his sister. So this article is interesting because at some points he seems sympathetic to the girl's sad fates. In other cases, he blames them for, for sort of straying from the path and allowing themselves to have forgotten their training and get into these circumstances. And yet he's also annoyed at the men and the fact that they're known to him and receive no punishment um, locally. Even though the majority of the girls who were in the home, whose futures we know, were likely to prove satisfactory to Shenston, the two seduction cases seem to have driven him over the edge and caused him to rethink his investments in the home. Citing financial reasons, Shenston pulled his support from the home in 1879, turning it over to Cockshut, who would manage it jointly with his sister Jane Laycock, who was operating her own orphanage in the Mount Pleasant area at this time until its closure officially in 1905. While the album is held in the rare books room of the Toronto Public Reference Library, it really remains a piece of Brantford's history. In the future, I'd love to see a plaque on 7 Sheridan Street, and perhaps in the future, the museum could host an exhibit about the orphanage so this history is more known to the local town, and that the girls' memories and Shenston's project would be not forgotten. But I thank you so much for having this opportunity for me to tell you about the girls and the history that they represent. When I look back on the photos, I see, I wonder about what hopes they had, what friendships they might've had amongst themselves and what beliefs they had about their future. Ultimately, I think the photos serve to document the young women's physical journey and separation from their kin, communities and culture and nations and their transformation from daughters to inmates. Thank you so much. <laughs>